You know, sometimes people ask me about the name of the street here because I'm Margaret Austin. Look, this is Austin Street. And I tell them, no, the street wasn't named after me, but by the time I'm through, it will be. The railway line in Palmerston North used to run through the centre of the town, giving the place one of its few excitements. It was a foregone conclusion they'd move the station outside the city. My birthplace was not given to encouraging excitement, and that included the drama of arrivals and departures. Of course, railway lines or stations mean noise and grime and a certain amount of disruption, and they were frowned on too. The innocence of my upbringing in 1950s Palmerston North was symbolised by my mother's cucumber sandwich afternoon teas, attended by her solidly respectable upper middle class friends. I, her Sunday school teacher daughter, had my role in it too. I knew just what to say and do, and I was a dab hand at passing around those sandwiches. I had no idea that life held much else until I left New Zealand at the age of 29. No idea that there were roles to play very different from that of the meek, submissive teenager who handed round those sandwiches. No idea, that is, until the fateful day in 1975 when I entered Amsterdam. You get off at Central Station, as I did, on a bright day with my little suitcase in one hand and my guidebook in the other, and as I cast my glance left, I saw a huge, blackened, very closed-looking church. This is the Basilica of St Nicholas. And here's what I wrote, inspired by such a sight. Let us pray. Before the smoke-blacked walls of Church St Nicholas, let us give thanks for all our possibilities and thus for our profanities. Let us give praise for the gutters which carry the overflow of man's excesses to circulate them through the sewers to surface in all their glorious stink. Let us walk the red light district and allow ourselves to feel the pain of our repressed desires. Let us pray that cocks may rise and cunts may open in a ceaseless litany of praise to the demon forces which are the life breath of this place. May this congregation be blessed with entrance to the kingdom of lust where we may dwell for all eternity. Amsterdam had an upside, and that's what I discovered one day waitressing in a seedy little hotel on the Kaisersracht. Illegal, of course. I was disguised as a waitress, stumbling around, feeding people at seven o'clock in the morning, and the dishwasher was supposed to be there, but he hadn't come, he was late. So I had to handle the dishes as well. I was hitting Jolly Cross when in walked the personage who was to change my life. This man was dressed in a white poncho, earring in one ear, and he handles those dishes as if they were juggling walls, and I wondered who on earth this was. Turned out, when I asked him, or dared to, he was a dancer, a jazz dancer. Well, that was interesting. I joined his classes, I became a dancer, I worked in a theatre as a dancer, and Amsterdam was a glorious, godless, fabulous time of discovery. Dark Bubbles. You look so good. 
says the young Japanese guy in the sauna. For your age, he adds. I take up a different yoga position and pretend I haven't heard. Later, in the slow lane, an aggressive aqua jogger derails my faltering breaststroke. There's no flaccidity in the pump class. All of us are pumped to perfection. Bare male chests burgeon in the spa pool and cleavages abound above the bubbles. Of a sudden, there's a grope beneath the froth. I glare, helpless, at blank faces. Me too? Something about my parents and my background. I'd mentioned the Sunday school teacher, but my parents were very different. Fourteen years between them, my father much older, and my mother, a school teacher, respectable, courteous, spirited, and lovely. It was my mother. She fell in love with my father, much older, a mysterious, dark character. My father was a silent man much of the time. He was a journalist. In fact, he wrote for the notorious newspaper Truth. Yes! And when a neighbour told me that my father had once frequented the opium dens of Haining Street, I kept that secret to myself, something very precious. What a father! And I'm the result of those two parents, which I mention as a way to perhaps explain the trajectory that my life has taken and how I'm wanting to make both of them proud of me, but to satisfy the dark explorer side of my father with my apparently proper exterior. Fast forward to out of Amsterdam in 1979 and on one of those long green European trains on the way to a very different culture which would bring me different experiences. I was headed out of liberal unisex Amsterdam to masculine Athens, Greece. One of the main squares in Athens is called Kolonaki Square. The other squares mentioned are Omonia and Syntagma. Omonia I'll always love. Syntagma, I don't care. But the one I want to write about is Kolonaki Square. They told me, you must go. The shops, the clothes, the air. Anyone who's anyone goes to Kolonaki Square. If it's business, sex, or leisure, or just to sit and stare, they're doing it in style in Kolonaki Square. One fine day, I went alone. They said, how can you dare? You must be seen in company in Kolonaki Square. I looked at all the cafe seats at those who'd paid the fare of a season's round of travelling to Kolonaki Square. They sat, secure in comfort, no signs of wear or tear. Appearances are what they want in Kolonaki Square. To sit and gossip all day long. She's hot, shh, cold. He's queer. Conversation never lacks for spice in Kolonaki Square. The atmosphere is quiet and calm. Car horns never blare. It's restrained and civilised in Kolonaki Square. I shook my head and turned away. Within my heart a prayer, give me what's honest, true and plain. Not Kolonaki Square. After some months of living in Greece, in Athens, and by then embarked on writing poems, which I started in the outdoor tavernas, scribbling them on the white paper tablecloths to the accompaniment of a glass or two of Retsina, that's cheap Greek plonk. And before the waiter came to take the tablecloth away, I swiped from him my first poetic scribblings. Lament for Greece. 
Greece, a mountain goat, wily yet treacherous, knowing yet wicked, but he has climbed high, had a world view from the whited Acropolis hill. Eyes yellow now with age, beard blown this way and that by all the winds of change, hooves roughened by centuries of picking their way up stony paths, yet with Ulysses saw and understood it all. Put out to pasture now, and content to watch the she-goats, he was suddenly taken from behind, tupped when he was tired, least aware, all his old strength twisted from him, used, violated, flung aside. America forced, flouted, fucked. The bitch, the bitch walks with big strides. The bitch wears red and purple and green together. The bitch is fit. The bitch has a sharp mind and she feeds it with many things. Information she feels, sees, hears, senses, knows, like she knows her own skeleton. And the bitch is like her own skeleton, smooth, white, natural, lean, hard, honed. What's left when the world and all its bullshit and tawdiness have taken their pickings, have picnicked all over the bitch, and through her, through her good offices, and through her orifices, through her senses and her body and her mind. And because she's what's left, she's honed, and she's hard, and she's dry, and she knows. The bitch knows. Being a bitch is not saying yes sweetly, not keeping that even worse, dumb silence between us when I'm mad as hell. Being a bitch is saying it there, out loud, making it sound and resound among our four paltry walls. The bitch is me. Okay, now, get the best thing now, it's all over. Burnt Offering One day, when I'm a heap of ash, will I think I made a hash of it? All those things I did and said, will they condemn me when I'm dead? It's not that I did something wrong, it's just that I sang my own song. Was I perhaps so out of tune that others thought I was a goon? I hope that I do leave behind something of value from my mind. Something to give delight to those who like to laugh, not fight. And then they'll say, she lived and loved and won the day. The Paris as a beautiful woman image has been overworked. But when I arrived there in 1980, I couldn't help but find it apt. Blatantly unisexual Amsterdam and unmistakably masculine Athens are both easier to come to terms with. Their values are clearly defined, and even if you don't like them, at least you know what you're up against. Wandering the streets of Paris, I couldn't help but be aware that she's classically female, her ever-changing facades designed to baffle and delight. She's bound to be harder on the women who choose to live with her cold embrace than on the men. Men at least have their sexuality to offer. Women must find some other way to prove themselves. Stage door. A stage door open to the night. She braves it, dares to enter. It took a bottle full of wine and she can't say anybody sent her. Her disadvantage weighs on her. French girls are so much smarter. Her teeth aren't capped, no nose job done, and she thinks she's a starter. I want to see the directeur, she blurts out at reception. No one turns a hair. It seems her fears her own deception. You want to dance in cabaret? 
He's fearsome, old and heartless. She talks of training, legs, quick wits, perhaps if she is artless. Undress yourself, madame, he says. And leaves her in the office. Dumbfounded, she leaves on her slip. At least she'll cut her losses. He's back again with Hitchcock look. Turn sideways on and smile. Walk towards me, hand on hip. All right, we'll give you one month's trial. She makes it to the chorus line in high heels, rouge and glitter. Costumes made and routines learned, yet soon her smile turns bitter. False eyelashes she's learned to fix, body makeup to spread even. They all say you look just great, it's the best show of the season. But what she wants is something else. She just can't seem to fake it. No matter what they say, she knows the Emperor is naked. After a stint in show business, working as a mannequin nu at the Folie Bergère, no less, it was a life of glorious superficiality. The art of putting on false eyelashes, covering myself with body makeup, hitching the g-string high enough on the hips, were all life lessons that I got taught by my fellow mannequins. But after a year of being a chorus girl, I was ready for another kind of adventure. If you know Paris, you may know that on the left bank is an old and famous bookshop. It's called Shakespeare and Company. It's a mixture of new books and secondhand ones, and you find them stacked in the shelves way back into the walls. There are even books in the old refrigerator there. Famous writers have always given readings at Shakespeare and Company. James Baldwin, Henry Miller, Anais Nin, to name several. And steeping myself in their tradition, I became aware of myself as someone who wanted to write also, and not just poetry. I had some friends who knew things about how to get work as a writer. And one of them said to me, look, you've worked in show business and you, you, you even know some people who know some people who know some other people and you like celebrities and you like fame and you like chasing people, so why don't you take yourself to the Cannes Film Festival and interview some stars? Well, that appealed to me immensely. I didn't know how you did that, but I would find out. You see, you can't just go to Cannes unless you want to be a hanger-on or one of those beach girls. If you want to go as a writer, you need to get accreditation. So I went chasing accreditation. One of my friends in the working in the newspapers in Paris told me I had to write and apply for it. Say I was a journalist, say I would represent them at Cannes. And just a week before the end of May annual film festival began, I tracked down accreditation from a South African magazine called Playgirl. <laughs> Would you believe there was a magazine called Playgirl? And I got to the Cannes Film Festival in 1984 as the representative for Playgirl magazine. Now my job was to track down interviews with stars, preferably someone young, male and sexy, said Playgirl editor. Right, so a rookie reporter abroad in Cannes in May of 1984. I took the fast train down south, found myself a cheap place to stay, hunted out places where I could eat for next to nothing, and went looking for stars. This was 1984. So the likes of Michael York and Anouk Aimé walking hand in hand along the beach. Catherine Depardieu, Catherine Deneuve and Gerard Depardieu were nowhere to be seen except at the premiere performances at the night, every, every night, so I didn't catch much sight of them. But I saw Dirk Bogard, 
He was the president of the festival that year. Harry Belafonte was there and Tony Curtis hiding under a huge 10 gallon hat. I spotted them all. I was so busy celebrity spotting that I forgot what I was in Cannes for. And only a few days before the two weeks were up did I realise that I had not got an interview or anywhere near one. Someone said to me, you've got to have an, a press agent to get an interview. Oh, said I, that was the next thing I had to do. So I tracked down a press agent who said to me, you've left it rather late. And there's only one major film coming to Cannes now. It's Mutiny on the Bounty. It's a remake and it's got Anthony Hopkins in it and Mel Gibson. Oh, I said, OK, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go for an interview with Mel Gibson. I thought, young and sexy enough, he'd do. Too bad, he's not coming to Cannes, busy with another film. Right. They said, you've left it too late. Indeed, I had. Someone tipped me off, though, that the other star in the remake of The Bounty, one Sir Anthony Hopkins, was indeed in town, and he was staying at the Carlton, as you do, a monstrously multi-storied building where all the stars stayed. Mr Hopkins was in town. He would have to do. So, your rookie reporter scribbled a note to Mr Hopkins and, and got the receptionist to put in his pigeonhole. Oh, they had pigeonholes in those days. And I left to walk the beach and think, well, what's going to happen now? I can't go back to Paris in disgrace with no interview. I went back and, and on the back of my hand scribbled note was a note from Anthony Hopkins. I would be delighted to give you an interview. Do come up. And he'd added his room number, the very top floor of the Carlton Hotel, of course. I had my journalist's clothes on and I had my notebook. I didn't have any questions. I thought, I've got to wing this. Up I went and knocked timidly on the door. It opened and there was Sir Anthony Hopkins, resplendent in a white suit, well, rather like this. It was so white, as were the walls of his suite, that I could hardly tell where Anthony Hopkins ended and the walls began. He was holding a goldfish bowl of gin. He promptly handed me one as well and invited me in. He was extremely charming. He picked immediately that I was a rookie and didn't know what I was doing or saying. He kept plying me with gin. When he found out that I was representing Playgirl magazine, his comment was, Playgirl magazine, oh, they're a bit of a cheesecake publication, aren't they? I don't think they'll be interested in, in me, will they? With a twinkle in those blue eyes. I didn't dare tell him he was a substitute for Mel Gibson. After about half an hour of him putting up with my bad questions, and supplying me with a pile of promotional material. He said, you can make your article out of this. He ushered me out. Well, I couldn't do anything with the material. I hadn't taken a photograph. You had to have a photograph. And I did return to Paris with my tail between my legs, in disgrace. My friends were sympathetic, but sorry. They said, you won't get back to Cannes, you know, because unless you produce an article as an accredited journalist, you don't get another chance. Ah, but I'd had the chance to spend half an hour with none other than Sir Anthony Hopkins. Waiting for Alessandro. Waiting for Alessandro, my new Italian guest, I wash my hair and wonder if I look my best. He sounded fine and in his text said all should be at my behest. Then he arrives, perfumed, and bent, it seems, on my intent. Oh, how to act, yet not to flirt. I could, I would, I'm not inert. Guess what? He likes books, admires my art, and has good looks. A girl can dream, and surely will, especially when he pays the bill. Even if... The girl's all keen. A guy should really not be mean. Instead, he should show charm and tact in the face of truth and fact. Say something like, you're just so nice, unlike my girl, who's cold as ice. With stylish manners, bow out with grace. And in that way, we both save face. This talk is called Ex-Husbands 
at the supermarket. You know, I've got two ex-husbands. Uh, some of my friends have a few more, but I find that two is just about right. And I was thinking about these exes of mine. I, I, saw them, I saw them both recently in the supermarket. We were all in the supermarket there. I mean, they didn't see each other. They didn't see me, but there, there, there were the three of us, you know, wheeling our trolleys and sort of delving into the deep freeze and um, loading up on loo paper and mooning over the marmalade. And it, 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 it struck me that romance may come and go, but groceries go on forever. My first husband. What well, we were in love. He had a, a beard and sunglasses and bare feet. And that was enough. Somehow being in love justified everything. You know, that justified living together. It justified me missing all my units in my second year. And above all, it justified me leaving Wellington, the city I loved, to follow my love to Dunedin, a city he loved. We were in love for about two years, and after, after that time, he asked me to, to marry him. Now, he did that, not because I think he especially wanted to, but to appease my, my very proper mother. We planned a very 60s wedding with poetry from the trendy Carlyle Gibran and bare feet and demented, a demented musician friend to play the organ. My mother, behind our backs, sabotaged all our plans after she was paying, and we ended up with a very proper wedding with shoes, hymns, and even the wedding march. We set up house in Port Chalmers, in a cottage overlooking a graveyard. Somehow that seemed to suggest to me where this relationship was headed. Two of my friends, female, single, were planning a trip to Italy, to Perugia, to learn Italian. Would I like to come? My husband let me go. He was liberal. And off I went to Italy. Seduced by Italy, though not necessarily by Italians, I returned after a couple of months recalled by a lonely husband. But the damage was done. I was hooked on adventure. I didn't want a husband, I wanted an ex-husband. And the only way you get an ex-husband is by getting a divorce. And so I gained my first ex-husband. Now, overseas again, this time, to Paris, and on a dark night, on a dark disco floor, I met a dark man. He was from the Cameroons, and his story was that he'd come to Paris as a student to study theology, and he'd fetched up in the French provinces, telling people how to live sinless lives. And one of his neighbours had given him some financial periodicals and he discovered that he had an affinity for the share market and for making money. And so he'd ended up, and because my French wasn't that good and his English wasn't either, I didn't understand just quite what situation he had and what position he was in. I only realised how wealthy he was because he would bribe his way to the top of cinema queues, give huge taps, um, tips to taxi drivers, seem to have in his pocket more money for a day than I would earn in a month working at the theatre. And one night when he was late for dinner, he apologised, saying that he'd been on the phone to Omar Sharif about his coffee shares. And on another occasion, by mistake, he left his briefcase in my apartment and finding the briefcase curiously, intriguingly heavy and unlocked, I opened it. It was full of gold bars. 
my man was carrying around ingots. There were probably payment from Mr Sharif. This man would have made a fine husband and I could have become some kind of princess in the Cameroons. But I didn't. On a return to Amsterdam, I ran into a man who was to become my second husband. And shortly after that, in 1987, I arrived back in New Zealand with the manuscript for my first book under one arm and a second husband under the other. The book went on to be published, but the husband got crossed out in the proofreading process. Nil desperandum, never despair, third time lucky. And my third time lucky turned out to be the most unusual man I've ever met. On returning to New Zealand and looking for excitement and not knowing quite where I would find all sorts of things, including romance, I joined a Toastmasters club. Doesn't sound very promising, you might that say, but one of the members of my club turned out to be Tony. Tony was the Duke of Wellington. And some of you will remember that Wellington had a Duke for about 20 years, a fun Duke in a scarlet waistcoat and a bicorn hat, complete with his own army. Tony gave me a wonderful courtship full of romance and surprises. When he finally asked if I would like to move in with him in his big house, I demurred, saying, wouldn't that spoil the beautiful courtship we're having? To which Tony replied, oh no, nothing will be spoiled. You'll have your own room with a telephone and I'll ring you up and ask you out just like before. The moral of the story is, if you don't want to be an ex-husband, don't be a husband in the first place. <laughs> I missed out the most important line, which was the best thing to do is to live in a permanent courtship. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> moral of the story. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't matter. Opinions. All of us have them by the million. Of what do I speak? Our opinions. On them we build our wordy mansions and raise them up as kinds of stanchions. We see our views as plainly right. Defending them is worth a fight. It's true that of them we make mention, but all that does is up the tension. So I say, be damned. Opinions, you know what? They're just our minions. Somebody once asked me, I think it was a radio interview, well, how do you, how do you become a duchess? And I said, well, a duke asks you. And actually, it's as easy as that. Now, I know that duchesses are in rather bad odour at the moment, and to say nothing of dukes. But actually, I'm, I've, got, I've got credentials for being a duchess. You see, I'm, um, I'm divorced, like Camilla. I'm middle class, like Kate. And I'm an actress, like Megan. So there you are, three in one. How I got to be a Duchess is, well, a Duke asked me. You may remember that Wellington had a Duke in the 80s and the 90s and the early 20-hundreds. A fun Duke with a scarlet waistcoat and a bicorn hat. And this is the personage I ran into when I joined a Toastmasters club. All sorts of people belong to a Toastmasters club and this unusual gentleman turned out to be a Duke. He courted me and offered me the role of Duchess and I took it on and life with the Duke was, well, surreal. Tony really was the Duke of Wellington. When I first saw his room, all I could think of to say was, it looks as if about six different people live here. And Tony said airily, oh, they do. And what's more, they all get on well with each other. 
Now that's about the most classic Tony comment I could think of. His acceptance of himself as being multifaceted and how well that worked for him is encapsulated in six people do live here and they all get on well with each other. There was Tony the Duke and protégé of the Wizard of Christchurch, which he was. There was Tony, who was the leader of Alf's Imperial Army. He had his own army and I inherited a regiment, the Duchess's own. A Morris dancer, well of course he was an Englishman. A wine imbiber and wine expert. A super salesman. Tony worked at Hallenstein's for years and if you went in there, you were a guy looking for a tie, you'd come out with a suit and a shirt as well. A dapper dresser and my very special friend. Tony was very resourceful and always able to come up with some quip or other. So that if I said at breakfast that I felt like that I felt like a boiled egg, he would say, well, you don't look like one. And if I said, your uniform, is it at the dry cleaners or in the wardrobe? He would say, yes. A lot of things I had to deal with with Tony <laughs> and being his secretary, believe you me, was one of them. He had a clothes maker, Mr. Peter Rigby. Oh, Mr. Peter Rigby Esquire. I was taken in my early days as Duchess to meet the Duke's tailor to see if I would do and what Mr Rigby would think of to dress me in. I think Mr Rigby approved of me and I'm wearing one of the outfits that he created, in particular what's called a Shaco hat because Mr Rigby specialised in military outfits. So that's the inspiration for, for this. And this became my, if you like, my uniform when I accompanied the Duke to civic occasions and to, of course, to, to greet royalty. On one civic occasion, we were invited with some members of the council and, some, and the newly appointed Russian ambassador to New Zealand were, were at dinner and we were invited the Duke and the, as Duke and Duchess, and sitting at the same table as the newly minted Russian ambassador, who kept watching in bemusement because the wine waiter would come and offer the bottle to Tony to check if it was the right wine. And the, the ambassador watched this going on for quite a few bottles, and then he, he leaned over and, and said, I suppose you two have been flown from London for this occasion. I left it to the Duke to handle that sort of comment. Prince Charles paid a visit in the 90s to Wellington and on his walkabout, well, of course, Tony the Duke had was going to turn up for sure with his raggle-taggle army members on one side. Well, he had me, but he also had Alf's Imperial Army lined up beside him. And I, and I watched to see what Charles would do. Then as Prince Charles a a approached this lineup of strangely dressed people, I could see him thinking now, I, this is someone I know I feel I've got, I'm going to have to say, I'm going to have to um, say hello to. So he shook hands with Tony um, and he said he surveyed the army and he just said to all of them, and, and who let you lot out? <laughs> that was the encounter with Prince Charles. A very complex man, very interesting, I thought when he shook my hand. Tony was resourceful in lots of ways. When we were once in Blenheim to open a croquet tournament, the weather was wet, the ground was damp, and my cloth shoes got soaked. And I was complaining at the reception afterwards, and His Grace took the shoes and went away and returned in a few minutes and gave me a pair of warm, dry shoes. And when I looked at him inquiringly, he pointed conspiratorially at the nearby microwave. Tony was a man of light-heartedness and I carry his legacy with me whenever I can and have a chance to be light-hearted. And sometimes to, to put down sneering media. Tony gave me the perfect line for the kind of journalist who would say something like, aren't you being rather pretentious? 
To which Tony the Duke would say, oh no, we're only pretending to be pretentious. So, as a protege of the Wizard of Canterbury, Tony the Duke also lived his life according to the Wizard's mantra. Well, sort of. The Wizard had a three-point mantra about living, that living well consisted of love, logic and levity, and a balance among those three. Well, the Duke's logic was all his own, but his love for Wellington carried him through his life. And as for levity, there was no one to match Tony, the Duke of Wellington. He is a toast to levity. This last poem is called On Haining Street. My dad took opium on Haining Street. It was the 30s. The Chinese made it possible. My dad was a reporter for truth. How's that for truth? My dad had a farm. He was really a townie. His khaki shorts hung next to his waistcoat in the wardrobe he shared with his wife. She loved him. Tamed him. Is that how it works? He muttered in retreat to the pub. No opium dens in PN. Raised three kids. Loved cats. Made pirate boxes. Late in life, my dad returned to old haunts. Lived in Wellington in a boarding house. Died at 70 of beer and cigs. Scribbling this on Haining Street, I am proud to be my dad's daughter. <laughs>